...possible by public television stations and by a grant from Sperry Corporation. Computer-based information systems for business, industry, government, and national defense. summer when gardens are in full bloom, we value the flowers for their beauty alone. But for bees and other insects, the blossoms are essential to survival itself. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature, and most of us know a bit about honeybees, their amazing industry and remarkable social behavior. But what about bumblebees, those much bigger bees that buzz from flower to flower all through the summer? In fact, the complex lifestyle of the bumblebee is every bit as intriguing as that of the honeybee, as we'll see in this week's film, shot by wildlife cameraman Stephen Balwell. After watching our film, which takes us to the woods, bogs, and meadows of Maine, you'll never again feel quite the same about a bumblebee. Without nectar, bumblebees will perish quickly. Every day of their lives, they face an energy crisis, greater than any that confronts us. Collecting nectar is a bee's way of earning a living. All its working hours must be spent commuting between flowers, nature's tiny energy wells. Bees are sophisticated entrepreneurs in a wild marketplace. They must profit from their investment of time and labor by harvesting scarce resources. The bumblebee's plight echoes man's own predicament in a way, but the currency bees deal in is nectar, the fuel which powers their business enterprises. Failure to secure it risks disaster for the individual and the economic collapse of bee society. To explore the life of the bee, an insect surprisingly well suited to life in cooler regions, we go to Bumblebee Country, the northeastern United States and the state of Maine. the long freezing months of winter, warm April sunshine brings renewed life to the marshes of Maine and their inhabitants. and a frog share a harmless encounter. It's easier to see a beaver than to spot the first stirrings of bumblebees in the forest soil. temperature rises, queen bumblebees awaken from a deep sleep 
and begin to dig themselves out of their hibernation chambers. Each queen has spent the winter alone below the ground in a state of suspended animation, surviving intense frosts, blizzards, and rain. Now, with the long solitary hibernation at an end, each must shake off its coat of soil and prepare for the busy life which lies ahead. A newly emerged queen's immediate priority is the discovery of fresh fuel supplies. Her first flight is powered by honey left over from the full load she stocked up last autumn. She must quickly find early blooming shrubs like leather leaf before her winter reserves are burned up. Sugar from the nectar of these flowers is energy for the new queens, literally bringing them back to life. These scattered oases of nectar are vitally important to other kinds of bees too. But foraging styles differ, and the pace of this one, the solitary bee, is pedestrian compared to the rapid bustle of the bumblebee. Stocked up with a full flight tank, each queen begins a detailed exploration of possible nest sites from the air. She lands frequently to look for hidden entrances to underground cavities. The woods contain a multitude of vacant lots which must be surveyed. Different bumblebee species vary in their choice of home. Some prefer to nest near the surface, others deeper underground, and some even use the abandoned nests of birds or squirrels. Their search is so thorough it may take a queen several days, often weeks, to choose the ideal spot. Bumblebees are social insects, and the queen is the link between successive generations. She mated the previous autumn, and is now a biological time bomb, ready to explode into egg production, but only when suitable quarters can be found. As she explores, protein from the pollen she eats is used to make eggs in her body. The other members of the once thriving colony from which she came, drones, workers, and her mother, the old queen, died as winter approached. Now it's her task to lay the foundations of a new booming society. Day after day, the spring countryside is searched until a satisfactory home is found. Only at night or during periods of bad weather will a queen rest and break off her relentless odyssey. But sooner or later, she finds what she's looking for. When established, eventually the colony will operate like a factory geared to the production of baby bees. Like any industrial tycoon deciding where to put a new manufacturing plant, the founding queen has certain building standards which a site must satisfy. It must protect against rough weather and provide building material like grass, hair, or moss, which can be fashioned into a nest chamber. The abandoned home of a small mammal, a deer mouse, vole, or chipmunk fulfills these requirements perfectly. But these sites are at a premium and hotly competed for. Other queens are prospective tenants as well. Alerted by the sound of the intruder at the entrance, the newly resident queen prepares to confront her rival. Fights usually result from these encounters and they can be lethal affairs. Both combatants possess deadly stings. 
At first, they warily face one another, raising their middle legs as in a duel, awaiting the opportunity to grapple and thrust home the poisonous sting. The fatal blow is struck. Mortally wounded, the defeated invader retreats to the surface. The bumblebee sting is not barbed like a honeybee's and can be withdrawn after use. So the victorious bumblebee can sting repeatedly without sacrificing her life. The retractable sting is a powerful weapon. She may use it to defend property on several occasions throughout her life. During these critical days, queen bumblebees have no greater enemies than rival queens. In the aftermath of these royal battles, as many as eight dead or dying queens have been found at a single nest entrance. Silent testimony to the fierce struggles which have occurred below. Those queens which have found adequate lodgings can spend the night there in comfort, protected from frost or rainfall. Others may be forced to pass the night outside without shelter. In the chill of the early morning, they're too sluggish for flight, something to be expected with a cold-blooded insect. But bumblebees survive even as far north as the Arctic Circle because they can generate heat to raise their own body temperature. To get airborne, only the furry thorax, where the wings are attached, needs to be heated. It houses the flight muscles. The cold start remedy is simple. To warm up the flight motor, the bee shivers internally. The thick fur coat minimizes heat loss. Though the warmth of sunshine is free, sunbathing takes time and it's unreliable. Shivering makes the bee independent of sunlight, but it's expensive because it takes a lot of nectar fuel. The only visible sign of warm-up is the pumping of the abdomen, bringing oxygen to the rapidly respiring flight muscles. Before takeoff, the power output from the heated flight motor must move the wings fast enough to generate the necessary lift and thrust for flight. Honeybees, like these, must also be warm to fly, but have the additional problem of heating themselves and their nests throughout the entire year. Unlike bumblebees, wild honeybees nest in hollow trees throughout winter as a colony of hundreds of individuals. They can only do so if they have a large energy supply available through the months when outdoor foraging is impossible. Honey stored in combs is both food and fuel, which the bees convert to warmth by muscle shivering. Honeybees keep their fuel bills low by heating only selected areas of the nest where they gather in clusters. In contrast, the bumblebee nest in its first stages is a small enterprise, though by now the queen has constructed a honey pot of wax and cups from pollen into which she's laid her eggs. The developing young must be kept warm, and when not foraging, the queen perches on her egg clump day and night, wrapping herself around it like a broody hen. She stops incubating only to drink from her vital fuel reservoir, the honeypot. Failure of the energy supply means death, and those queens unable to keep their honeypot full perish before raising a brood. Incubation is costly and requires an enormous quantity of food calories to generate the necessary warmth. To keep this central heating system going at around 86 degrees Fahrenheit, a full honeypot can be sipped dry overnight. Incredibly, the bee's flight muscles, which produce heat and drive the wings, may be disengaged by revving up in neutral 
the queen can dump excess heat into her bloodstream and transfer it to the undersurface of her abdomen. From there, it radiates to the brood. Energy shortages slow down the growth of the young. The queen must leave the nest frequently for refueling. In a month or so, the brood will reach adulthood. Now the season is advancing. Soon, the queen's progeny will have a vital role to play in the bogland community. The marshes and ponds of New England were gouged out by glaciers during the last ice age. Onto the empty stage came a distinctive cast of plants and animals. Carnivorous pitcher plants, which supplement their diet by trapping insects in their funnels. The curious land-dwelling form of the red-spotted newt, quite at home on the sphagnum moss. And higher up, a caterpillar climbs out of reach. A hoverfly, disguised as a bumblebee, but without a sting. Dressed like this, it's less likely to end up as a meal for a bird. All around the bog in spring, a chorus of male red-winged blackbirds flash their gold-fringed epaulets, attracting females and challenging one another. Here, beavers, plants, and bees depend upon each other. They're bound together in their environment. The dark shadows of encroaching forest inhibit the growth of flowers, which are so vital for the bumblebees. But beavers help the bumblebees by felling trees to build dams. They keep the forest pruned, creating spaces where plants may blossom and bees may feed. month has passed and the first workers have hatched and joined the labor force in the Queen's underground factory. But none can survive for long without drinking deeply from a honey pot. Additional eggs are laid in the cells made from a mixture of pollen and wax exuded from glands in the Queen's abdomen. The next stage, the larvae. When fully grown, the larvae spin yellowish papery cocoons. Looking like living mummies, they pupate within into adult bees. A new bumblebee, ready to emerge, must bite its way into the world. Getting out is a lengthy struggle and often requires the assistance of other workers. This one is going to need a little more help. The newly emerged bumblebee is silvery gray. Soon the bright adult fur coat will appear and the soft wings will harden and become airworthy. 
In some nests, nurse bees feed the larvae by opening a hole and passing nectar and pollen through the thin, waxy envelope. Then they reseal the hole. As colony productivity increases and its economy booms, more and more resources need to be harvested from the field. This is what workers are for. In the summer, from dawn to dusk, stopped only by heavy rain, fog, or wind, worker bumblebees labor to find food supplies and transport them back to their colony, the bumblebee factory. The whole enterprise is fueled by sugar and pollen. The management of this industrial economy is sophisticated. 80 million years of natural selection have honed and refined working practices to the peak of perfection. Exploiting nature's market garden requires careful balancing of costs and benefits by the individual workers. They must decide how to allocate their own energy resources in foraging. To make a profit, each one's income of nectar must be greater than the nectar spent on commuting to work. The profits available from different flowers vary from time to time. Over their working lives, the thrifty bees must balance the books. This factory makes bumblebees. On its assembly line, workers are not only the labor, but the very machinery of production. The more there are of these working machines, the greater the number of finished queens and drones. The worker's versatile tongue is an indispensable tool in the gathering of bee capital, nectar. But the bumblebees don't lay up huge stocks of honey. Early in the year, honey stores and converted cocoons are just enough to see them through the rainy days. Any capital surplus is immediately fed to the larvae, making new machinery, extra workers. Workers and their tongues come in a variety of sizes. The larger ones have longer tongues and on certain flowers can reach the nectar parts other bees cannot. When not in use, the tongue folds back beneath the head. Pumping it like this may help evaporate water from the honey and concentrate the flight fuel before going out to forage. Pollen, the protein building material, is carried into the nest on the rear legs and scraped off to be stored. As the nests get bigger, the problems of keeping the brood warm increase. Sudden drops in temperature can stunt the growth of young bees or produce defects like shriveled, useless wings. In this factory, quality control is important and is helped by heat conservation. Bees save it by using grass and plant fibers as roof insulation. They're regularly inspected and rearranged to trap heat given off by the bees. In some species, the thatchers are joined by plasterers, using a mixture of wax and pollen to build a canopy over the nest. Nothing is wasted, and excess wax on the brood surface is scraped off and recycled. If the nest overheats, the canopy can be opened, allowing warm air to escape. A well-established nest will sometimes attract an unwelcome visitor.
agitation spreads through the colony. Fanny, which usually cools the nest, acts now as a burglar alarm. This intruder is what's known as a cuckoo bumblebee, determined to take over the colony. If she kills the queen, she will lay her own eggs and have them reared by the resident workers. But first, she must survive the onslaught of a fearsome battery of stings. Though the cuckoo bumblebee is heavily armored, determined resistance can drive her off. She may even be killed. Market, the bumblebee is like a first-time shopper faced with a tremendous choice of goods. A naive worker bee must decide which are bargains and which are rip-offs. For in the evolutionary game played between flowers and bees, neither side can afford to lose. Each is the other's key to survival. For flowers, the bee is a go-between, transferring pollen and aiding fertilization. In return, the bee gets nectar and pollen, the price the flower pays for its services. Both try to maximize their rewards while minimizing the energy they must spend. The flowers offer only a tiny part of the pollinator's needs. Filling the bee up at one sitting would not encourage it to flit from blossom to blossom. So, the flowers can manipulate the bees. But the bees may cheat the flowers. The jewel weed may be robbed of its nectar without being pollinated. Jewel weed can be entered legitimately through the front by probing over the flower's reproductive parts. But the short-tongued bees find this difficult. They've discovered the nectar can also be stolen by biting through the spur beneath the flower. So by relying on their individual initiative, the short-tongued bees have learned how to profit from this particular flower. They will specialize in this theft as long as the jewelweed blooms. An efficient thief cleans up after a raid. This basswood tree also provides nectar for the foraging bees. Flowers vary in the way they package their nectar and pollen. Wild rose, for example, offers only pollen. But good deals are soon cashed in as the bees compete for bargains. Bumblebees don't fight over resources. That would waste time and energy best spent foraging. Instead, they scramble to outperform their neighbors. The various flower shapes present awkward handling problems. On the wild rose, bees vibrate the anthers to shake the pollen free. On thistles, they plunge deep into the spiky head. Specialization allows a bee to obtain the full economic return from a particular blossom.
skills learned at one bloom are best concentrated on similar flowers. But there are dangers. When the rewards begin to diminish, the bees must be able to switch to a different flower, affording better prospects. As the nectar resources change, so must the bees. It's not unlike the stock market, where upcoming commodities can be spotted, and as the rewards go up, investments are shifted to exploit them. Honeybees follow a very different strategy. They evolved in the tropics where rich, clumped resources are more common. A concentrated food supply, if it's more than can be gathered by an individual, is most efficiently harvested by a colony working together. But a scout bee discovering such a location must be able to communicate its whereabouts to other workers still in the hive. Those honeybees returning with knowledge of a profitable site advertise their discovery by dancing. The waggling movements are a form of language with information for the onlookers about the direction and distance of the new food source. The response of the workforce to the dancer's message depends on the hive's need for the advertised product. With large storage facilities, they can ride out the lean times and quickly respond to windfalls aided by sophisticated communications. The honeybee hive resembles a large multinational corporation geared up to exploit big markets. In contrast, bumblebees are like individual craft workers in a small cottage industry. They don't need elaborate communications. Each bumblebee, although working for itself, contributes to the common good. There's order in this apparent chaos. As in a factory run by humans, business efficiency is improved by division of labor. Some live all their lives inside the nest, the cleaning and maintenance department. Others work outside to gather raw materials. Of course, bumblebees don't reason like humans, but biologists are struck by the close parallels between the everyday economics of bees and people. The need for fuel to move about is shared by both the bumblebee and the human commuter. It's expensive for both to get to work. But in the bee world, at least there's no inflation. The cost of nectar remains on average the same. Just getting to work is hazardous enough. Industrial accidents are common and flight paths over roads are especially risky. On average, a worker has a life expectancy of only two weeks. Many predators lie and wait. Up to half a colony's workforce may vanish in the field every week. Even a sting becomes useless when tangled in a sticky spider's web. Forced landings on water attract lethal assassins. The water striders sharing this meal are opportunists 
to wait for food to drop in. The mouse plays for bigger stakes and will risk being stung to seek out and run down poorly defended bumblebee nests and plunder the brood. Many colonies go bankrupt this way, their accumulated stocks destroyed by mice. But borrowers, like mice, eventually repay their debt. This year's mouse residence may be the site of next year's bee factory. In nests whose workers successfully repel mouse attacks, minor damage can be repaired. A colony's ultimate aim is the production of as many new queens and potent males as possible. At the moment, this factory is still growing. It has about a hundred workers, but there will come a time when the colony can no longer replace dead or worn out workers and will have to switch to turning out large quantities of the final product, queens and drones, the ultimate profit. the period of the colony's growth, the energy balance sheet of each bumblebee at a flower has to be carefully juggled for it to show a profit. While gathering pollen from meadowsweet, the bee vigorously brushes the flower, moving quickly from one to another, all the while using up large amounts of honey fuel. It costs a great deal of energy to keep a bee foraging. Even when working on flowers, flight muscles must be kept heated to the right temperature so that the bee can take off when finished. On some plants, the bee may not obtain enough nectar to make the whole effort worthwhile. Goldenrod contains only minute amounts of nectar in each tiny flower, but there are hundreds spread over the plant. On these, bees can minimize spent energy by cutting their flight engines to idling speed and crawling from blossom to blossom. Bumblebee heat regulation is an extraordinary natural phenomenon. They can automatically lower their body temperature to save vital calories. These flightless bees are not just suffering from a lack of food. They are thriftily controlling their energy. Sometimes they cool down so much they're unable to take off. Monkshood flowers contain large amounts of nectar and are pollinated almost exclusively by bumblebees. But inexperienced bees have a hard time finding the nectar hidden inside the petals. Amazingly, there are some bees which, in spite of the short-term energy loss, take the time to learn how to handle difficult flowers. In the long run, they are amply rewarded for their efforts. Fireweed also has a valuable reservoir of nectar and a bee can earn enough to keep the flight engine revved up, spending up to half its foraging time flying from flower to flower. This is no mean feat since it may be carrying its own weight in nectar and pollen.
Bumblebees are resilient flyers and will travel several miles to forage. The numbers of flowers in an area fluctuate throughout the season, but assuming only one flower per square yard, a worker that can travel three miles from its nest has some 75 million flowers to choose from. But even with a wide range of choice, competition is fierce, and there's always a special flower every bee favors. For plants, the big payoff in their intimate relationship with bees is fertilization. Fruits and berries are one result of this symbiotic relationship. A whole community of animals, from birds to mammals, like the raccoon, reap the harvest of the bees' labors. Attracted to the juicy edible fruits, they transport the undigested seeds, and by spreading them as they wander, help plants colonize new areas. Within this living community, the impact of bumblebees is immense. Thousands of plant species are heavily dependent on them for pollination. With the days growing shorter and autumn approaching, fewer flowers contain nectar. The profits for the bees begin to plummet. It's now almost time for them to complete their short life cycles and begin the final production of queens and drones. For the greater part of its life, the colony has been producing a sisterhood of workers, all daughters of the queen. Now males, the drones, have appeared in the colony. They develop from unfertilized eggs. The young males hang around for a few days drinking nectar before leaving the nest forever. The appearance of the queen is linked to feeding all the fertilized eggs from which workers develop have the potential to turn into queens. But those larvae destined for the role of monarch are fed frequently and for longer periods. The most successful nest can produce hundreds of virgin queens and drones. Queens stay for a while stocking up on nectar and helping to incubate the remaining brood. Soon they will depart to mate and find a hibernation site before winter sets in.
Stormy weather and downpours present a serious problem to the new bees which have abandoned the shelter of their birthplace. To a drone or queen caught without cover, a bombardment of gigantic raindrops is a serious hazard. Nests, too, may be flooded and destroyed by prolonged periods of heavy rain. It's imperative that colonies disperse their reproductive individuals before the real winter weather takes its toll. On sunny days, drones may bask themselves on flowers. They only need to feed themselves, ignoring pollen and concentrating on nectar. Since they're under no pressure to return home fully laden, they save energy by slowing down while waiting for the opportunity to pursue and mate with a passing queen. During mating, the smaller male climbs on the queen's back, holding on tenaciously with his legs. He may remain mounted for only a few minutes or as long as an hour. Queens have even been seen flying with their partner clinging to their back. Males don't have stings. Instead, a complicated copulatory organ tips the abdomen. A pair of claspers allow him to grip the queen and fertilize her. Social behavior in bees may be encouraged by their genetic makeup. The sister workers are more closely related to each other than they would be to their own offspring. So the workers may stand a better chance of passing on their genes to future generations by helping younger sisters live and reproduce rather than raising their own young. The mated queen carries similar genes to those sisters that cared for her, now left behind in the nest. With the departure of queens and drones, the once bustling factory begins to close down. The declining worker population is less able to keep at bay the legions of scavengers which take the opportunity to move in. Ants will feed on any remaining brood or nectar stores. Normally, ants don't attack adult bees. Another, more menacing guest irritates them. a plague of mites. They can incapacitate the bees. Encrusted with these sinister living jewels, there's nothing they can do. Attempts to brush them off are useless, and if the infestation is bad enough, the mites may decimate the bee colony. Mites may be joined in the nest by the grotesque juvenile stage of the hoverfly, which in adult form mimics the bumblebee. It feeds on nest debris and, if spotted, is immediately attacked. But it too can fall victim to mites. As the bee colony collapses, the factory floor becomes decorated with a living carpet. Many different parasites and scavengers benefit from the decline and fall of bumblebee society. But perhaps the most extraordinary are the caterpillars of the wax moth, which spin a labyrinth of silken tunnels through the nest. From the security of these tunnels, they venture forth to eat the wax comb. The dying survivors can only stand helplessly by as the caterpillars surge beneath them.
So the old queen finally abdicates, abandoning her industrial palace to the forces of decay. With her entourage dispersed and dying, many before they reach adulthood, her autocratic regime eventually collapses. The central heating system is in ruins. Dampness encourages the growth of mold. Fungi will inherit the nest. Underground and on the surface, autumn leaves its signature. In the of the New England fall, as bumblebee activity dies away, other animals remain, and so do the inexorable laws of energy economics, as applicable to the moose as they are to the bees. The moose, the largest living deer, is a vegetarian, which feeds in the forest on leaves and in the ponds on plants growing underwater. The aquatic plants, rich in mineral salts, are poor in energy whereas the forest diet provides abundant energy, but few essential salts. The moose requires both to survive, so like the bumblebee, must organize its foraging efforts to get both. The beaver is confronted with a similar dilemma. Feeding and maintenance of its lodge and dam takes time and labor. Nothing in nature is free. All behavior has costs as well as benefits, and energy accounts must be settled. It's a plight that faces beavers, bumblebees, plants, and people. The bumblebee year is over, and a mated queen seeks out hibernation quarters. She has energy reserves of fat and a stomach full of honey. Finding a suitable site, she burrows into a chamber. Within, as the temperature drops, glycerol in her body tissues will act as antifreeze. Here, the sleeping queen will lie all winter long, oblivious to the cold world above. She is the one secure investment for the future of her species. we go for the first time to India and the National Wildlife Sanctuary at Bharatpur, where the year the monsoon failed to arrive created a compelling natural drama. The Missing Monsoon, our film next week on nature. Another in our continuing series of programs on nature. A beautiful program, an enlightening one. It bears your support. Call us now to subscribe at 372-1200. Our operators are waiting.
This program was made possible by public television stations and by a grant from Sperry Corporation.